Happy Friday afternoon. Um, so your, your names and your businesses are in the program, and so maybe we can do something a little bit funkier for an introduction to kick off the last panel. So tell us what gets you out of bed in the morning, why you're doing what you're doing, and why Somerville? <laughs> um, just to reiterate, I am Zach, um, working with Bow Market. Um, what gets me out of bed in the morning is, is knowing I have uh, an incredible opportunity um, to create exactly what I want to create, but I have to do it pretty much today and tomorrow and the next day. Um, and uh, and, and I, I really want it to happen, so I, I get out of bed and make sure it does. And then what were the other ones? So tell, tell, for the context, tell us what you mean when you say you want it to happen. Describe a little bit what it is. Yeah, absolutely. So um, we're working on creating a, a, a marketplace uh, in Union Square, um, a little ways that way, sort of by um, PA's Lounge and Sally O'Brien's. Um, and so to get that done, we need to sort of form different partnerships with people across Somerville and people across Cambridge and Boston, um, within the city, in uh, the private space, uh, community groups, um, and so making sure that everyone is sort of on board with the project and, and, and ready for all the work that needs to get done is um, what we're really focused on today. Um, and so, you know, we, we have sort of a limited time to do this all in um, because of the, so the real estate market and the uh, approvals market and zoning market, all those things are changing very, very rapidly. So we're trying to get ahead of it um, to ensure that this can be a success. Mm -hmm. And, and why do you want to create this? And why do you want to create it in Somerville? Um, I want to create it because it's a place that I really want to go. So the, 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 the vision is that we're going to create you know, a, an outdoor space with a lot of really small scale vendors um, that can do sort of funky things, things that you wouldn't necessarily um, be able to afford to try out um, in much larger spaces with much larger leases and, and much larger financial commitments. Um, and that sort of plays into why we're doing it in Somerville. So in Somerville, we have an opportunity to tap into an amazing um, artistic community, international community, you know, people that really understand that if they want to try things out, they have places to do it, and we want to be one of those places to do it, and Somerville is, is exactly, that, exactly that place to, to have these sort of different experimental projects happen. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so I'm Alan Donovan. Uh, my company is Oat Shop. It's an oatmeal-focused cafe. Uh, we do a pop-up right now two days a week in Brookline and have plans to come to Davis Square in the fall. Uh, so what gets me out of bed in the morning? Um, kind of similar, similar to what Zach said. In, uh, well, a, bowl, a good bowl of oatmeal gets me out of bed in the morning as well as uh, you know, the opportunity to create something and, and, and something that I saw a lack in the marketplace for for healthy breakfast options and, and something that's interesting and different and, and doesn't really exist, at least not in, nothing like it in the area. Uh, so that excitement um, is a big reason I'm creating this project and, and, and a big reason for getting out of bed in the morning. And uh, in terms of why Somerville, um, really love the area. They have such a great food scene. Uh, think it's the right customer base, lots of young people. Uh, and, and the college students helps, especially in, in the Davis Square area for, for something that's a bit new and, and a new and different concept. Um, yeah. Were there other questions I missed? No. That's good. Cool. <laughs> My name is Townsend. I um, have a small coffee company called Somerville Coffee Crew. Um, <laughs> to answer the question of uh, what gets me out of bed every morning, I would definitely say my day job. This is a... Uh, it's a lofty goal, it's a big dream to uh, work on a small business, especially to do it by yourself, and there is a lot of responsibility. So I uh, stay motivated by the end goal of what that is, and yeah. Um, I chose Somerville to start this business because I'm from this area, I've been living here for a while. I really love Somerville, I love the people here. There's a lot of great things already here. I know a lot of people at small businesses in this area. It's a very open and uh, caring community and uh, coffee is a really great way for me to give back to that area, or this area per se. Um, yeah. That's great, okay. Now we also don't have to go in order, I'll ask you a few more questions and definitely you know, feel free to chime in if you have questions, I'll try to keep my eye on the audience as well. Um, but you don't feel like you have to go in a particular order and feel free to come back and build on each other's ideas and, and let's make it conversational. Um, so in terms of the beginning, 
like you're now all at different phases of looking, you know, you have locations or you're, you're building, you're legitimately building to launch. Before that, when you had the idea or the vision of the dream, how did you pressure test the concept cheaply? How did you figure out this is gonna work? Who did you interact with to try to do that? Can you tell a little bit about that earliest stage of the process? <laughs> Um, so before we were, you know, in earnest working on the exact project we're, we're working on now, uh, a few years ago, myself and one of my partners um, had looked into doing a, a similar but less large-scale project in, in Cambridge. Um, and so we started getting in contact with vendors and started getting in contact with people that might want to have been involved um, in terms of, you know, are there... Are there vendors, are there artists or artisans that are interested in having small space, small space um, on a regular, in regular intervals to sell their wares, um, you know, sort of in the center of a, of a square like Union Square at the time, Central Square? Um, there was a ton of interest. We got a lot of interest from the people wanting to have an opportunity to sell their things um, and interact with the community in that way, but we ran into a lot of the zoning issues and the sort of permission from the city that sort of killed that project a few years ago. Um, and so since then, when, it, when, it, when a location uh, opened up or the opportunity to have a location opened up, we sort of turned back on in terms of heavy precedent research. So in terms of building a marketplace, um, I don't know that we were going to be able to build a small marketplace because it, it, it has to exist as, as a larger thing, but we did a ton of precedent research uh, around Boston, around the country, and around um, around the world to understand how do these things support one another? How is it that uh, someone can can exist in you know uh, um, in in a stall you know a tenth the size of the space we're in now um, and and make it work? And so from doing all that research and understanding how we would be able to sort of outfit a property um, to have the the minimum needs of a of a vendor. Uh, we came to understand that this was a, a viable project that we could pursue. Uh, so for me, with a food product, uh, testing is, is of utmost importance. And so initially, I, I come from the finance world and saw the problem myself and definitely felt the need in that sense and then started to, to bring it up to others if they would be interested in in kind of a different healthy breakfast option, something that was quick and, and hardier than, than the current options out there. And then from there, just started having people try the product, and that started from, from family and friends initially just to get their feedback, and then eventually more into getting it out there to the public, because family and friends might not, not always be fully honest with you. So uh, that's why I'm doing a pop-up right now two days a week in Brookline to really get to sell the product, get in front of paying customers, see what they like, don't like, gather all sorts of feedback, and, and kind of get the mistakes out of the way now before moving on to the permanent brick and mortar lo location. So I, I guess I would say that our project was a little bit different in that um, I have a design background. A lot of my uh, initial project or the design for what we're working on, and to give some context to what it is, um, we are currently building a 1971 Citroen H van. It's from France. It's an old school vehicle, and the concept is to basically have a coffee van uh, roaming around Boston, Cambridge, and Somerville. Uh, initially, this project started in California, of all places, kind of strange, but I moved out there for a bit. We started this uh, up in Northern California. We initially pushed out in uh, farmer's markets. Mm -hmm. So we just wanted to make sure that we really understood the rhythm of what it was and what we were trying to offer to individuals in our community and really get a good sense for how to talk about coffee and educate people about that stuff. Uh, I eventually moved back, and the process now has really been, while we wait for our truck to finish being built out, uh, building strong relationships with people in the area and really trying to understand what it is that we are trying to um, provide our customers. So going to different coffee shops, meeting the different business owners there, uh, you know, making friends with the baristas, and really just trying to understand what it is that, you know, the challenges that they face, but also um, how are we going to apply that to what we're doing, because our our delivery system is a lot different. We're in a truck, so we have new obstacles. Uh, we're doing something a little bit different. Zoning is a lot different for us, um, but it seemed like a viable option or the preferred method for us because we didn't have the kind of money that would be needed to start a brick and mortar. Okay. Um, so a lot of media on entrepreneurship 
tells the story of sort of the heroic individual going out alone and you know conquering demons and things like that. But I think the reality for a lot of entrepreneurs is that certainly at the very, very early stage, mentors, influencers, champions, partners, folks like that are really instrumental to making some mistakes cheaply or, not, or avoiding them altogether. Can you think of, I'm going to sort of add another question into this as well. Can you tell us a little bit about who someone like that for you has been and perhaps some advice that you received from them that's really influenced you arriving to the point that you're at now with what you're doing? I would say that for our particular situation, it's been a culmination of different individuals giving a, us advice at the right time and knowing when to take that advice and when to follow up. Um, when we were in California, some of the earliest advice I got actually was on a bus to San Francisco. Someone had suggested that I find a mentor, someone that wasn't in direct competition with me, that I could go and consult and talk to about different obstacles that I was facing as we established our business. Um, when we moved back here, uh, the, the gentlemen, uh, the couple, Ryan and Kim from Loyal Supply, have been instrumental in guiding us in a lot of our business practices, but also just kind of the way to think about introducing things or um, just how to carry ourselves with people in the area and really uh, establishing community as the central kind of theme throughout all of our stuff. Mm -hmm. That as long as we keep the community in focus and we make that our priority to make sure that we're giving back to the community that we're in, um, that seems to be the most important for me at least mm -hmm. as we work on our project. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think for me, my, my background is not at all in food, no experience in, in any restaurants or food service, so it's been tremendously important to get out there and meet some people who have done it before and take advantage of all the resources. And luckily, there's a really tight-knit food community in the area, all sorts of meetups and things like that to participate in and, and, and find folks who are trying to do the same thing as you or have already done it. Um, so it's been, been important to put together a team. I have a restaurant consultant I've been working with who's run restaurants himself and has, able to, has provided invaluable insight to me throughout, as well as a lot of informal mentors, just people that I've met throughout, um, have been able to really help and, and definitely avoid a lot of the mistakes by running things by them and, and getting their advice and input. Um, it's, it's a tremendous resource, even though you know, you might, might be technically the only one part of the business, but you can really form, form a, a great group to help you and get you through all sorts of challenges throughout. Mm -hmm. um, I'd say when, when I started working on this project in earnest, I was new as a business person to Union Square, and uh, Esther here has been invaluable in terms of introducing us to sort of a lot of the players in the square. There's so many community groups, so many interesting, um, you know, smaller businesses and medium-sized businesses and larger businesses that she's been really instrumental in introducing us to. Um, it became very apparent when we were starting doing this that um, we needed to you know, form a coalition with the community and with the business owners in the community and the, the individuals that live in the community to make sure that everyone was really comfortable with what was going on. Um, and that's been incredibly valuable to, to the success so far of the project. Um, in terms of a, a piece of advice that really sticks out, um, it came to me a bit randomly. I'm not even really sure who said this to me, but um, the idea of, of staying true to the concept and, and sort of ensuring that the concept was built around um, the specific project, not just sort of a, a project at large or a project in, in any locale or, or context, but staying true once you've got it and ensuring that you're not sort of compromising too far one way or the other. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really been a guiding force for, for myself and our partners um, to make sure that we are sticking to what it is that we wanted to do and, and, and not allowing some of the financial criteria or zoning criteria to pull our product down um, mm -hmm. in one way or another. Mm -hmm. Great. So I have more questions, but I would love to hear from anyone in the audience. It could be questions, comments, things you want to share. Does anyone have anything? OK, I'll keep going then. Um, so this is a little bit of a dovetail from that. So uh, uh, there was a piece that came out in the Business News Daily yesterday or last week that it has research that actually shows that a lot of small businesses, uh, it, this is vague to say, but they don't, they want to stay small. And that when they did this research, and I, it was empirical research, I don't know how they framed the question, that, that, that the people they interviewed said, we actually, you know, growth sort of for growth's sake is not our top priority. I know we're anomalies. And then the researchers came back and said, actually, you're not anomalies. 88% of all the people that we surveyed across the country 
who are small business owners want to be small business owners. And their theory was that um, because, again, to the media, so much gets written about these sort of insane growth strategies and we're here and now we're all across the country and all this kind of stuff and huge investments to do this, that it creates a perception both in the audience and then in entrepreneurs' minds that n wanting to grow and grow fast and grow big is sort of the, the goal. So that is just a backdrop, not leading into a particular question. How would you define success? Because you're all very early stages. You have something in mind of where you're trying to get to that feels like that's going to be success. Can you qualify and possibly quantify that for us in some way now? Maybe. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I was thinking about, it. yeah, yeah. So I think. Success to me, and, and to try and quantify it a little bit, would be, you know, if, if, in, if in, let's say, five years, um, as the market's been open for, say, four of those years, if someone that is a friend of mine but doesn't know that I worked on the project invites me to Bow Market, that wow. would be success. Nice. I love that. Uh, I guess to just kind of address my initial feeling of, what success would be. Um, that moment that I actually get to open for the first day and get to see everything kind of happening the way that I had kind of pictured that in my mind. Um, speaking to the point of um, massive growth and change in that way, I think, because it was a question that's come up before, um, for me I would say that I have hesitation with wanting to get bigger than what we are or what it is right now because it's hard for me to think that far ahead. Mm -hmm. um, but. I would say that my biggest priority is that it becomes something that people come to Boston or they come to Somerville or Cambridge and this is something that they look forward to having here uniquely. Mm -hmm. So I would rather keep it small and, and that feels successful to me to become a staple in the city that I want to be in and to know that when people come here they make it a point to come visit our shop. So I would call that success in my mind. Mm -hmm. I love that. Um, I would say kind of similar to Townsend, I think it's tough to to really think too much about growth before even opening a, a first location. Um, so that's something that's definitely, I guess, in the back of my mind. But I think initially what I would look at as successful is, is just creating a, a community place and a place that people are excited about and people make part of their daily routine. I think success to me is seeing people come back day after day and, and that being kind of their, their morning routine, something that they look forward to every day. Um, and I think, you know, one day, I think, it's, it's natural to think you would want to expand and, and, and get it out to more people, and maybe that means more locations or wholesale or things like that. Um, mm -hmm. But I think initially, um, I'm just trying to take it one step at a time, and, and it's yeah. hard to really focus on, on growth when I haven't even really gotten started. <laughs> yeah. I'm coming back to you guys if you have anything. Yes. I think a uh, unintended byproduct of our truck being built and some of the delays around that have actually helped with this exact situation and that um, we had a period of time where we knew that the truck was going to be built. It's currently being built right now. There are delays. That's something that I think a lot of us don't want to you know, incorporate into what we're doing, but it unfortunately is that. And so for me, a lot of what I decided to do or, or spend that free time while I was waiting for things to be built is to go to the different shops, learn about a lot of different things that they're doing there. Uh, you know, it became a non-competition almost to meet with uh, the coffee business owners and uh, the baristas. I became regulars in a lot of these places. I take a lot of photographs in general, and so I will usually be with my camera in some instance. I uh, started getting invited to different things in the coffee community and really tried to become a part of it so that when we do pop up, we're not just some random company that started doing this and now we're here and you know help us. And that was also very important for our Kickstarter. So uh, spending that time, investing it back into the community, making suggestions, offering to help in other places, it's kind of been a scratch my back, I'll scratch your back kind of mentality. And I think it's actually started to help out a lot and I see that in our Instagram and I see that in just kind of the community walking around and talking to different people. And so. When I run into individuals, they ask me about how that's going, and sometimes that's stressful, but at the same time, I know that they're actively watching and they're waiting for something to happen. 
Yeah, I would say definitely have some similarities to that in um, just the importance of, of getting the word out there far in advance of actually opening. And, and social media is huge, especially in the food space with pictures and Instagram being such a big thing. So that's something I try to be be active in as well as um, just doing things like pop-ups and events just to, to get the word out there. Word of mouth is huge, especially when, when you have a, a physical location. So getting into that area. So I'm doing a, a market in, in Davis Square. Um, which, which absolutely helps. And, and just being generally plugged into the food community is, is absolutely important to get the word out there and, and be able to reach the media and, and make, make announcements and things like that. Um, so that when the time comes to open, that people are at least familiar with it and, and curious enough to try it out. I'd say for, for us, we're, um, we're exploring sort of what we're gonna do with social media and, and things like that. We're also really relying on um, the community of vendors to uh, bring, in, bring in their own people. So we're really hoping that this will be an exciting opportunity for the vendors that they want to encourage people to come and see them, which I'm sure they will. Um, and we're also sort of taking, taking strides to ensure that we're driving people to the space from different events and opening up the, the courtyard spaces, the outdoor spaces, to all sorts of groups around the community to ensure that they know they have a place where they have you know outdoor space um, with with you know a lot of um, you know there'll be beautiful trees and a great view um, of the of the sky from the space and so making sure that we're sort of again forming that coalition and, and interfacing with as many groups as possible to 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 put people in a in hopefully what will become a really cool area of Somerville. Um, so our timeline, um, if all goes according to plan, uh, <laughs> is uh, to be open around September of 2017. Um, and the funding that we're going after is, um, is traditional bank financing. So um, one of my partners is, a, is uh, an established um, um, developer and, and architect in the city and sort of, you know, people know what he, he's capable of doing and, and you know, working with uh, what he calls you know, just relationship banking to sort of, you know, understand that, that when he says that this is a project that he's comfortable um, with doing and obviously having the, the, the numbers and the, and, the, and the sort of commitments from vendors to, to back that up, that they're comfortable giving him that, you know, that loan to, to make it happen. Uh, so for me, in terms of timeline, uh, I plan on getting into space in Davis Square in early October. Um, and would hope to have a pretty quick turnaround, but again, that really depends on licensing and permitting and all that stuff, which usually takes longer than expected, um, but would love to be, be open sometime in November, realistically. And uh, for me, I don't have any experience, so traditional financing wasn't really an option, um, so I had to go more on the savings and, and friends and family to, to get started. Uh, so our project was actually slated to be completed, I would say, at the beginning of June. Um, some unexpected issues came up with engine work and a custom clutch that I don't really know much about as far as the truck goes. Um, but it is kind of the territory that I run into with a specialty vehicle of this kind. A lot of this stuff is different. Um, things don't operate necessarily the same way uh, in France and Germany, which is where the parts are coming from. So kind of utilizing this time to work through some of the permits, work through some of these things that I know are coming, the less sexy stuff in this project, I would call it. Um, so I would say right now we're hoping for fall or October. We have everything we need to get that going. We're just waiting for the truck to get here. Uh, as far as funding this project, it really has been a straight out of my pocket into the business kind of mentality. Uh, when we got to a point where we felt like it was achievable to hit a Kickstarter, we went ahead and ran a Kickstarter. We worked on that from October to January, just making sure that we had the right kind of wording and the communication. Uh, we had taken all the photos. We had used a lot of the stuff from our uh, Instagram account, things that we had already kind of built and designed ourselves and reincorporated that into our Kickstarter. We had spent so much time working with people in our area and the community that by the time the Kickstarter came up, it felt like it was going to be a successful thing, and it was. Um, we asked for $10,000, and we got it. And um, I, I think that lar largely had to do with just the amount of time I put into going out and meeting people and working with individuals in the area. And yeah.
I would say that it's a combination of both. I think there's a lot of hesitation with working with another individual, uh, especially, I mean, I guess working with family could be equally stressful. Um, but I think going into a project like this, there's a lot of hesitation up front about are we going to stay on the same page forever? Are we going to work on these things and be in agreement all the time? Are all of these things always going to work the way that we're thinking they are? And I think for us in our situation, we we're very aware of that up front, and I think we've been really good about keeping things flexible. That both of us have different ideas. We want to share those ideas, and we find a good way to compromise and meet in the middle. And I think over time we've built a certain aesthetic that we've kind of started to follow and we've had less conversations about direction and more about just implementation. So, um, and we, we actually shift a lot in what we're doing. So sometimes I'm working on uh, sending out emails and doing the Kickstarter rewards and she's working on our taxes and stuff that isn't as exciting, but you know, we shift and like I said, we, we make that work and we help each other out and so it's been successful. I don't have any partners, so. <laughs> uh, I'd say, so we, my, my partners and I formed a group um, before taking on this project full time, and so it was, it was sort of a, uh, a coming together of a team that, that we thought would fill up different niches. Um, in terms of pursuing this project, it was absolutely that we, we had a shared passion for, for what the vision of the space would be, um, and, and, uh, and sort of went at it, went at it from there. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, I'd say for us, um, uh, all three of us in the partnership have had a chance to travel um, and, and seeing these, these sort of markets abroad has been really, really inspiring for us and knowing that people can make a living in a really small space and, and, and can make it incredibly vibrant just by packing um, you know, a small space with, with as many um, vendors as, as can succeed. Um, and uh, one of our partners is, is British and has, I think, had his eye on, on making something like this to sort of rec uh, recreate what he was used to back home. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's been a lot of fun to try and bring some of those uh, more foreign influences to the heart of you know, the most international space in, in Somerville. Yeah, so um, in, in London, some of the, especially some of the food markets like Borough Market and Smithfields and St. John, um, and then um, I think some of the, the uh, marketplaces and piazzas in, in Rome, because they're, very, um, they're not very green and they're very outdoors, which is the sort of um, look and feel we're going for. And then um, I had a chance to take a vacation to um, Seville in Spain, and that was really just, you know, everyone just sort of around a space and, and occupying it, and that became the decoration is sort of the, the design elements that we're going for for the space. Um, I definitely drew inspiration from, from other businesses outside of Boston. There's a place called Oatmeals in New York, some, some similar kind of porridge cafes in, in New York and London. Uh, so that was definitely something I looked at for concept validation to see that it was working there. Some of these businesses have been around for three or four years and have been very successful, so that was something I definitely looked at and, and looked at what I would tweak and what I would do differently and had the chance to visit some of the businesses in New York and, and, and it definitely helped me inspire my concept and see what works for them and what I thought could be done a little bit better. So that definitely helped. I would say that our initial concept was entirely based off a trip to Japan. Uh, we went to Osaka and we saw a gentleman with a coffee cart and the setup was so incredibly simple, and I think that was the rabbit hole that started a lot of my business, actually. Um, it was just so beautiful and intimate and real, and the coffee was excellent, and I think to have something so simple um, be so complex if you want it to be was really inspiring for us, and, and so we drew a lot of inspiration and a lot of the ritual aspect of what we're doing with our business from those practices uh, from Japanese coffee making. So when we came back, uh, the idea for a coffee truck actually kind of came from an indirect uh, project that I was working on at the time. And the idea was to not have a truck that was like everyone else's truck. So 
we basically went look. We went looking for a truck, and uh, we, f <laughs> yeah, I wish. Uh, <laughs> we went looking for a truck, and uh, after hours and hours of looking for something on Google and different places, we actually found something, and it was the Citroen H, and it really worked in our favor because it had this. It's a uh, post World War II vehicle. It's it's crazy looking. They made less than five hundred thousand, and. Um, it really lent itself to this kind of European cafe feeling. And we wanted to merge that with the, uh, the Japanese style of coffee making. And so it really presented itself in kind of a completely new way. In my mind, it was a mashup of these two worlds that celebrate coffee in two completely different ways. And to kind of add to our own thing, you know, being designers, we, we want to make it inherently our own to something that looks completely different than everyone else. And yeah. Well, I think what's interesting is, I mean, you're all in food retail, food and beverage retail. And so what's unique about entrepreneuring in food is that you're, Zach, you said, I wanted to create a place that I would want to go to. Um, and I hear that in all of your stories. So I wonder if beyond the inspiration of, you know, what did you see or what did you visit that made you say, okay, this is, I'm starting to have a picture in my mind. What are you noticing in yourselves as eaters? Because you're consumers of your own business in the sense that you're designing something that will feed you. Um, and what trends are you noticing in the communities that you're looking to serve or the demographics you're looking to serve that you, give you confidence? Okay, there's me and then there are all these other people. Can you describe that a little bit? Like what do you think people are hungry for, pardon the pun, that you're going to be able to deliver for them? Um, I'd say the, the, the trends that, that I've really started, you know, noticed before the project but have been reinforced since the project are these two guys right here. So people really focused in on doing one thing, one concept really, really well, um, as opposed to starting trying to be a jack of all trades. People are really honing in on, on executing um, on, on a thing. And, and that's exactly what we're hoping to populate the market with, because that's what can work in a small space. So I think a cart you know, is, is about maybe half the size of one of the spaces that, that we're you know, hoping to fill. Um, and it's, it's exactly the sort of mantra that, that we are looking to support and, and sort of give people an opportunity to um, pursue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think a big part of our initial business idea or just one of the things that we wanted to make sure that we weren't doing is we didn't want to become coffee snobs. We didn't want to become um, too airy to be able to explain something or we didn't want to deviate from just being a normal customer. So I think that one thing that I try to do anytime I'm at a coffee shop is just really try to listen into the average customer. Um, I do love coffee and I'm very particular about certain parts of coffee, but I also realize that not everyone can be that way or nor do they want to be. So just trying to make sure that I keep that, that grounded kind of perspective on what it is and what the customers are really thinking about. Because it's easy to get lost in the world that you've created for yourself mm -hmm. with these things. Um, you know, I think above all else, quality and consistency will always be the number one thing in my mind that we'd like to aim for every time we make coffee. And to invite a dialogue around coffee and curiosity and, and to make sure that customers feel welcome, that they can ask those questions when they come to our location or our truck. Um, it's really important to be able to give back to the community in that way and not feel like they're just ordering and then they need to shuffle off because they can't ask the kind of questions they want to. Um, keeping it small and intimate, I think, also really plays into the Somerville area. I think a lot of individuals here like small, sentimental kind of experiences, and I know that I do. And so when I go somewhere, I, I think it's that's, in essence, why I want to go back, if that makes sense. You know, you kind of take it all in. The coffee was good. The people were really nice. And um, everything just kind of comes together to create this first impression that I'm hoping will make people want to come back. There's a, I don't remember who said it, but there's someone said the millennials want, don't want to buy stuff, they want to buy into stuff. Yeah, and definitely I would agree with, with some of the points he said with, with trying to create something that's really inclusive in the food world. I know uh, some places can come off as intimidating, whether that be the coffee or, or certain ingredients in food. So something that um, 
I want to create something that, that is, is familiar but still interesting um, that kind of pushes the boundaries of what you would typically think of as, as, as oatmeal, which has this kind of boring grandma connotation. So how to make that interesting but still make it approachable mm -hmm. um, is something I, I definitely wanted to, to create in a big, big part of it.